gosh. Welcome to another wonderful podcast episode with Amy Harrell. Amy, good morning. Hi, Sherman. How are you? Very well. I know good. we recently spoke about your brilliant morning schedule of waking up at three in the morning. And so yes. we have to make this a very short episode so that you don't siesta live on the show. Yes. Okay. <laughs> Can we park here for just two seconds? So for a, a little over a year now, I was getting up at four and I was like, what happens if I get up at three, man, it just mm -hmm. radically changed my life. But then suddenly I could not get out of bed at 3 a.m. And so then Dang. I did that enough days in a row, about 90 yes. days in a row that I just, it was horrific getting up at three. So I'm sitting with my daughter who's a bit obsessed with Dolly Parton. Okay. I don't know why, but she is, we go to her theme park and she yes, just really yes. thinks this woman is amazing. We're watching this documentary and do you know her whole career, she has gotten up at 3 a.m. Really did not know and, that. And I was like, if Dolly can get up at three, I'm getting back up at three o'clock. I'm inspired. I needed like a kick in the pants. That's mm. what I needed. And I was still productive and I was still able to do, but I didn't have margin. I like mm -hmm. margin. I like to know that I have time to do something sporadic or spontaneous. Sure. If it's too rigid, I just don't feel, I don't feel free. Mm. So I'm like, yeah, for me to have time freedom, I'm going to get up at three and just give myself a longer day. But the only way I can do that, full disclosure, is if I take a nap. Siesta time. Okay. <laughs> so we're bumping up against siesta time. Yeah, so it'll be real <laughs> concise, but juicy. We'll work on it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So today's episode is going to be incredible because... We're going to chat about what happens when you say no to a prospect. <gasps> and I can already imagine all the butt clench moments <laughs> when from listeners going, whoa, whoa, hey, hold the door, hold the front door. Hey. What do you mean saying no to a prospect? Exactly. You know? And Look, so, Sherman, I butt clinched the first time I even <laughs> thought about saying no to a prospect. So I've uh, been there, done that. Yes, yes sir. Yes. How did that come about for you? Oh, man, Sherman. Okay. Now, there is seasons where, especially if you're transitioning, like, from your job to the full-time business, or maybe the business has gone through a hard time and you need to say yes to people, right? Mm -hmm. Period of time because you have bills to pay. You have responsibilities. Mm -hmm. We're really talking about post, what is the word, when you are in survival post mode. Oh, okay. Yeah. All right. So once survival mode has gone away and things are a bit stable, it's time to really think about who these clients are. So there was two, two instances, one specifically I'll tell you about that was not that long ago, maybe four years ago, when I had a prospect come to me through a third party lead generator that by the way, my lowest return on investment from that third party lead generator has only ever been 1200%. It's a great lead generator, right? Amazing. Amazing. But I get this client who owns a company distributes sex toys. Okay. And I wasn't quite clear that's what they did, but it's not my job to judge the product. She was ethical. She had integrity. She ran her business well, and I knew I could help her. And so I take on the job with a really nice check coming with that job. But my gut told me, Amy, the two of you are just not, she's yeah. not ideal. She's got the yeah. money and she's got a successful business and she is passionate and she is ethical and she has integrity, but there is something not ideal about this relationship on both sides. We just were not a good fit. Sherman, I got 30 days into that contract and was like, here is all of your money back. I am in, you can keep everything I built for you. I don't want anything back. It's all yours. And I realized then I did that twice in about a six month period of time. And it was painful to oh, give yeah. people 30 grand back is yeah, painful. Yeah. Plus yeah. all the assets, plus all That's the time. And I realized then you have got to man up, Amy, and say no. When that trigger comes up in your knower of, mm -hmm. oh, I, I've heard this before. I've been in this relationship before, and this is not going to go well for me. It's going to go great for them. But yeah, for yeah. me, 
it, we're going to be missing satisfaction. And that is a metric that so many owners ignore because corporate America doesn't care if you're satisfied. Here's mm -hmm. your satisfaction. Every other Friday you get your paycheck. Be quiet. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we're not taught to follow our knowers, especially when it comes to prospects. We're just told, take everybody correct, and figure correct. it out as you go. And that is a huge mistake, especially when it, you're trying to scale or you're trying to accelerate or grow the business to another profit level. Where does the satisfaction come from? Do I just feel it? Is it based on values? Mm -hmm. Is it based on parameters mm -hmm. of how I work? I do mm -hmm. prospect. How can you expand on that? Oh, that's such a good question. So I would say it comes from two places. One, does this person want you to focus on your highest and best value? Mm. So there's a lot of things we can do. There's a lot of things you're good at, right? Mm -hmm. You're a done for you guy. You are hands on. Your team is hands on. And there are some things that somebody else could do. It's just not your highest and best. You do it and you can do it well. But to focus your time and attention on it means you're saying no to the thing that is the highest value to you, but it is also the highest value to your market. And how would you know that? Because you ask them, you attend to their most desired outcome. And you know that this thing, this is the one thing that's going to get them that outcome the fastest and you're the best at it. So I would say that the very first thing is, is the client asking you to focus on something other than your highest and best value? The second thing is, are they willing to pay for your highest mm -hmm. and best value first? Or do they okay. only want the fringe services that are pennies? That's right. That's right. Okay. Yeah. So let's say your specialization, your main specialization. Yeah. And whether they have to budget for it. Correct. In other words. Yeah. yeah. Okay. okay. Yeah. Because, and I'll say this, the reason why we focus there, and remember, all of this comes back to the culture. We, as a culture, have been trained to buy now based on algorithmic engineering. So we are all being programmed, whether we want to admit it or not, by this world of algorithms that is developed by humans. And algorithms don't focus on everything well. They focus on the one thing you do well. That's how you get high returns on ad spend. That's how you get lots of people that are so idyllic signing up for your opt-in and you don't end up with an email list of garbage. It's because you focus on the one thing you do well. But if we reverse engineer all the way back to the beginning, we can only do that if we know what the market puts the highest value on that we do. And do we agree with that? Mm -hmm. If we don't agree with where our current market is placing the value, we need to go get another market that places value on where we're putting value, which is very easy to do. That's why I loved when, you know, Facebook came out with advertising because suddenly for someone that was always having to advertise to get the word out about her business, I could turn it off and on. You could not do that with billboards, radio, and print advertising. That was not an option. Now I had the control of toggle on, toggle off, toggle on, toggle off. And that's the message that you're sending to the algorithm. Don't do this, do that. Toggle on, toggle off. If you don't know what to toggle on and toggle off, neither does the algorithm. It's a robot. So it's very important that we understand that the reason why this idea of focusing on the highest and best value and saying no to anyone that does not put emphasis on our highest and best value, we have to focus on that. Otherwise, when we go to scale, so scale is just simply duplicating your highest and best value to a bigger audience and then doing it again to a bigger audience and then doing it again to a bigger audience. It's the difference between putting a billboard on a highway that's just within a county and on the interstate that runs between states. That's what scale is. If Chick-fil-A, let's take Chick-fil-A for instance, if they had billboards on the highways that said, eat meat, eat cow, come eat our hamburger, but then on the interstate it said, hey, eat more chicken, 
there would be confusion, right? Because they would not know where people put the value. They do. They're very clear on that. They don't sell beef. They only sell chicken. And then they only sell certain kinds of chicken, right? They, and they sell it in a very specific way. Why? Because that's where the people put the value. And so that's the point here is if you have any hope and any prayer of ever scaling, you have to learn to say no as painful and as anxiety ridden as you may feel about it. Just do it a few times. I'm telling you, it'll be freeing. And then suddenly right. the more and more of the ideal come to you because now you're listening clearer. There is a, there is an intentionality and in you're listening to these people and you're like, oh, they sound like Joe Schmo, who I love to work with, or Jane Doe, who's amazing and paid me mm -hmm. really well and wanted me to do the thing I love best. Those are the people we want more of. Okay. So in addition to that, Amy, in addition to them valuing my specialization, mm -hmm. what would you pay for it? Yeah. Where does value fit? Like my personal values mm -hmm. of what I will service and what I won't service and mm -hmm. personality fit play yeah. in, in your uh, mix? Yeah. I don't think that you as the owner can define your highest and best value if you haven't first defined your personal values because otherwise anything goes it is shiny object syndrome and i have this quote memorized and suddenly the gentleman's name has left my mind but we'll post it somewhere the best quote on shiny object syndrome was when an owner lets priority walk out the door 700 times a day so if we do not define our highest and best value the things that we love to do based on our personal personal values, then we will say yes to every Tom, Dick, and Harry, and we'll do whatever they want us to do, however they want us to do it. And we will always be struggling to pay the bills and to stay engaged and excited about our work. Personal values are the very core, the very foundation of where you begin to build work value and satisfaction. That's right. That's right. Okay. I buy that. I buy that. And so what is the one practical thing that our listeners can take action on? May or may not be in conversation with a le less than ideal prospect right now, yeah. but, but yeah. what can they have in front and center in their mind as they watch this yeah. for the next time that comes around? If you have not trained yourself to listen to sales conversations or be in the sales conversation, this might sound foreign to you because how do you determine who to say no to? So the one thing I would tell you, the one best advice I would give you is to take one question to your most ideal client. So when you think about ideal, I would jot down everything that makes them ideal. Are they married? Are they single? Are they remarried with children? What is their socioeconomic status? Do they have a higher education level or any education at all? Are they self-made? Are they, or were they propped up in some way by an opportunity? These are things to determine. So first, Make a list of all of the attributes and demographics that make up your most ideal client. Then go to people that are current clients or past clients that fit this profile and say, hey, your input really matters to me. I want to ask you one question. If you had to describe what I did for you to someone that doesn't know me, how would you describe it? Then you gather, even if it's three, five, 15, 20 responses, and look at what they all say that's the same or close to each other. That's your answer. So now when you go and you listen to sales calls or you're in the middle of a sales conversation, if that prospect does not say, this is my problem and this, and I don't know how to solve it. And they're not saying what the ideal client said you did for them. They're not your ideal. So here's a good example. I'll give you a really practical example. Let's say that Sherman, just because I know your work, you have your ideal client. Let's say that the majority says, Hey, you know what you did for me? You helped me for the first time get a real return on investment from Google ads, SEO, GMB, which is now what GPP or something, GPP, Google yeah. mm -hmm. professional, Google, Google business profile. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there you go. Google business profile. And you helped me create really beautiful digital assets that the client has told me 
caught their attention. All right. So now ring, ring goes the bell and here comes Joe Schmo from the internet. That's, Hey, I saw that you help businesses with GMB and SEO and ads. I have tried this with other agencies and I couldn't even get a $200 return on investment. I spent 18,000. I still have nothing to show for it. So I'm really looking for somebody that can get me a return on investment. That would be an ideal client because they're saying what the majority said you did for them. And as long as that thing is in line with the thing you love to do. So that's what we're talking about. If this guy was like, hey, I tried this other ad agency. They couldn't get me a return on investment. I want you to get me a return on investment. And I don't really, I don't want to use GMP, GBP. I don't want to use SEO and I don't want to use AdWords. I just want you to take my $300 budget and go make me 25,000, but no ads. Goodbye. Click. That's the no. Could you do it? Sure, you could take $300 and turn it into probably five or six grand. Not doing advertising, but the amount of work, the right. amount of, because those people have no content. You have to do everything for them from no, for nothing. When it all comes down to it, $300 is like 30 minutes of your work. Mm -hmm. So the answer is no. That's right. That's right. So we and have when you to, say no to, you're saying mm -hmm. yes to a future ideal client. That's right. That's right. So for instance, in my world, if somebody comes to me and wants me to do the work for them, the answer is no. If they want someone in their organization to learn to do the work and they want to bring in their scaling efforts in-house with an exception or two, then I'm the person that's going to help you learn what I know and take my assets and duplicate them inside your company. That's what I do. I'm not going to be the person that you contract for 20 years that does this work for you. No, no. So that's, those are very simplistic examples. I could get really detailed, but the only reason why is because I know what people say to me and you as the owner have to listen really well. Are they saying what the ideal client says? And is that what I want to do for them? If the answer is no, just say, you know what? I could help you, but I'm not the best person to help you. Let me help you find someone. Yeah. Yeah, that's brilliant. Amy, thank you so much for highlighting why and the what and the how mm -hmm. to say no to a less than ideal prospect and sharing your own personal examples, albeit painful at times. But I love how practical you got to how we can interview our existing or previous clients to mm -hmm. get those identifiable tidbits, yeah. filters. Yeah. yeah. That's right. And that's great. That's super. Thank you so much that's for your time again, Amy. Let's catch welcome, up next Sherman. on the next episode. Folks that are watching or listening to this episode, thanks for joining us today. Stay yeah. tuned for our next episode of the Amy Harrow Podcast. Cheers. Thanks, Sherman. Thanks, guys. Bye.